joined by Dr. Doug Brackman. And Doug, thank you for accepting uh, this invitation. I'm writing my next book. And I got to know you uh, personally, but also through this book, Driven, which is just an amazing book, Understanding and Harnessing the Genetic Gifts Shared by Entrepreneurs, Navy SEALs, Pro Athletes, and maybe you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. So I, I was talking with Joe Polish, who introduced us, and he was talking about these alleles that make us different. What is that? Is that just made up? Is so, that no, it, so the an allele is a genetic. So they used to question, you know, is it nature versus nurture? And epigenetics, the field of epigenetics, has answered that question with yes. You cannot discern nature from nurture anymore. So the allele gene is, is something that is, is aberrant or different depending upon whether it's activated or not. And so we have these alleles or repeats of the gene. And so one of the genes that I've looked at in Driven, you know, dopamine receptor DR dash D2. So it's the second dopamine receptor. There's five, six, seven two, and then it's a dash A1 allele, hmm. which means on the A1 chain, you see a difference compared to normals. And so if you have this allele or different gene, meaning that it's expressing itself, it comes out as boredom. Hmm. And so it is something that, you know, everybody has the DRD2 gene, but the dash A1 allele is meaning that it's different than you. I see. So yeah, it's, it, it's now, you know, since writing Driven, it's been six years, five and a half years, the, just the leaps and bounds in genetic research alone hmm. as, you know, bastardized us. I've just simplified the crap out of it, really, because I'm a clinician. And now I go to Snippedia, which is the geek website for all uh, things genetic. There's 143 different alleles or different combinations of these things just associated with boredom. Crazy. And so, you know, the way you experience boredom and the way you're wired for boredom, you know, that you need novel new experiences, otherwise your central nervous system gets wonky. Mm -hmm. It tells you that there's something missing or wrong right now. Yeah. And so that, that you know, is, it's wildly complex. Mm -hmm. Increasing the complexity that you can turn on and off these genes depending upon the environmental exposure. On top of that is the perception of the environment. So what's stressful to you or what's boring to you, I won't be perceived as bored. Huh. And so it becomes so ridiculously complex that, you know, is it, and everyone seems to, you know, want to attribute it. Well, it's my, you know, my nature is I was born with this. No. And yeah, you were born with the tendency to be that way, but it's not fixed. Right. And so, you know, it, the simple answer, you know, Joe, and I, you know, these, and one of the reasons we hit it off so well is both of us have been, you know, in the addiction field. This is, that is the addiction gene. Uh, and they, you know, oh my God, they found the alcoholism gene. And that was 1991, the year in our grad school. And Time Magazine article came out about it. And that was the DRD2 actually one of the old, and, ah. within three years, it's, it's also gambling addiction. It's also eating disorders. It's also entrepreneurship. It's also high-performing athletes. It's also, and so they quickly see that, you know, there's no simple explanation for human beings, huh. you know, especially on the genetic level. So it's, but there is something that's what we were talking about before we started this is, is holy, shit, this is real. We are different. <laughs> we are, yeah. being an entrepreneur is different. A lot, very different. And you know, I, I, you know, we feel different in school because we don't learn the same way. We get bored, like you said, very easily. And that entrepreneurial energy is just unstoppable. I, I was talking with Heidi, my wife, yesterday about something. And I said, honey, you just don't understand. I can't stop. I need to keep pushing this. And it's not pointed at you it's just i got to solve this problem and i got to get moving on this and it's just it's innate inside of me and i'm learning so much more about myself 
meeting people like you and, and other entrepreneurs. And we are, we are different, you know, and, you know, the, the overarching theory and I'm, you know, in my next book coming out in April, it's, it's that driven was written to driven, written to entrepreneurs, you know, about you and it personally, this one's about us in society and how we are different and how we really are. Yeah. It, it's, Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> we are important. Um, yeah. We, as I, am writing this we are both the plight we are both the gift to the world and a curse so it's <laughs> and now everyone oh, i want to be driven it's like yeah you know joseph goebbels was probably driven too you got to be careful about you know the the badge of honor that's the truth and, and so it is you know that this responsibility and the title of the book is sheep wolves and shepherds hmm. and the you know default modal network which is really since writing driven taking a you know, front seat and understanding you know, the self and self psychology and ego structure in the brain. We have a different default modal network. Yeah. And so, you know, the theory as, you know, the human herd went from little hunter gatherer groups of basically jack of all trades entrepreneurs is struggling to survive into these massive societies, oh. you know, millions of people, the default modal network seems to have adapted to you know basically a w2 job you know hmm. basically ad adapted to this very sedentary predictable safe ag agricultural world and you know why are these genetics why why haven't we been bred out <laughs> of hmm. existence is because we matter we are the ones who are waiting for the, the catastrophe waiting for the chaos waiting for rapid change in our environment and these cell phones, this this internet, is absolutely the most rapidly changing thing in our culture we could find. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, created by entrepreneurs. But man, if we don't take responsibility for it, you know, we we the sheep, or you know, most we all are sheep to varying degrees. But some people's brain structures really support that. Yes. And you know, they they. And as entrepreneurs and starting businesses and running businesses, you understand you do not want a bunch of entrepreneurs trying to work for you because they won't. No. And so you, we need the, you know, we need the normals more than they need us. Is that what we call them now, normals? I think so. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, Justin, he, he, yeah, I mean, he, he has all kinds of choice names for them, but they are. They are not neurodivergent. They are not different. Yeah, that's funny. I did listen to your podcast with Justin. I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. Yeah, I know Justin. He's, he's awesome. Yeah, and that, that, that constellation of differences, you know, individually, interpersonally, it's, it, as you say, we can't stop. It's not possible. You know, I was, set, I was fishing with my cousin, Michael. And he and I grew up fishing and you and you and I both love fishing. Yep. And he turns to me and he goes, Stephen, when's enough enough? And I said, you know what, Michael, that's an interesting question because I learned it's not about stuff or money. It's about making things happen. It's about being able to dream something and just create it. I said, it's, it's, it's about constantly creating is the way I've designed my life because I know I'm not happy if I'm not doing that. And that the way I describe human nature, you know, we have monkey over elephant mm -hmm. and we have soul, mind, body, soul. And I am careful to say it, but I will say it anyway, is that drivens are very soul aware. And, you know, this, this, the part of us that is made in the image of God mm. is our soul. Mm. That is creation, manifestation, yeah. change, making better evolution. And that's, that's part of God's nature, but our bodies aren't <laughs> so as repaired and broken, and, you know, so we are both not wired for this world, but are also not wired for the limitations of you know, the human body. And so I beat so many of us to just beat the crap out of ourselves and work ourselves or exercise ourselves or work ourselves to death. Yep. And yep. so, you know, when is enough enough? 
And so I, I, what I teach very simply is, is, you know, human, the difference between your inner world of being a driven and reality, mm. because good enough is in reality. It's not a feeling. Yeah. And, you know, my doctoral dissertation never felt good enough. Mm. And I spent 18 months just reading, trying to collect enough information to feel smart enough to actually start. Yeah. And, you know, Jim Spira, bless his heart, my chair. Congratulations, Dr. Brockman. First time I ever got called doctor. The inner world experience was, ha ha, he bought it. Huh. Because it was, you know, it was not that good. It wasn't. Mm. But it's hanging on my wall. <laughs> so it's good enough. It's Shat real. It's real. So that, that discernment between, you know, and that's what I teach in Driven is that we have to do this work. We yeah, we don't have to do our shadow work. We have to. Otherwise, we are dead. Yes. And it's a channeling of that energy for me. And, you know, I like to talk about Australia, right? Where all these criminals went from prisons in, in, in England over to Australia. And now Australia is either entrepreneurs or criminals, right? Go figure. Or both. Yeah. Or both. Yeah, they, that's true. But I believe it's just a channeling of that energy because we can do it for good or we could do it for bad. And that that is, yeah, man, you lay up for my book because it's, you know, people that proclaim to be shepherds of the sheep. If anyone's proclaiming to be a shepherd, they're a wolf. <laughs> they're not <laughs> because it, it is, I am science, you know, Fauci, the great driven, and it is. They're power hungry, power addicted, mm. you know, to, to control the sheep is what gets their dopamine kicking. Yeah. And we see that over, you know, Genghis Khan to Goebbels to Hitler to whoever, Stalin, you know, they're driven. They get it. They get how to manipulate. They get how to play the game. Mm. It's like us. Yeah. But what they're addicted to is, you know, evil, basically. And, you know, a driven that is actually owning their wolf, that's intent, like, I might be a wolf here. And working on their wolf has the potential to become more shepherd-like. I love that so much, because I have a chapter of my new book, which is what we're talking about, believe it or not. It's called E-Squared, The Power of Entrepreneurs, Investing in Entrepreneurs. And it's a yep. bunch of fables, right, that kind of bring home stories. And there's one chapter that's called manipulation. Um, let me find the chapter quick because I just I just had it on the top of my tongue. Manipulation and, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to chop this section out. Let's go to here. This is gonna have to be edited for sure. But here we go. Manipulation, motivation or inspiration. Yeah. And I call that the hierarchy of leadership, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is leadership because early in my days, I am ashamed at the way I manipulated people to get what I wanted. Yep. Right. It could be, it's because I pay you now do the friggin' job. Right. Which is not so awesome. And it, it is, you know, my overeducation, that's management. That is literally you're, you're managing people's external circumstance, either through reward or punishment, whatever you want to call it, to control behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And people hate to be managed. That's right. So I, I, my next one is motivation. And that's where I put my will on you. And then you do what's good for me, Mr. Entrepreneur, owner, or whatever. And it doesn't feel so great, but at least I'm not bullying around with the manipulation. And so th this is one of the metaphors I'm using in my book is and by chance, synchronicity. You can, you can lead and direct sheep two different ways. The driver is at the back of the herd <laughs> with the big stick banging it and scaring the out of the sheep. Mm. And it's literally driving the sheep to slaughter. Yep. Where the shepherd is in front of the flock. 
Hmm. They have the same big stick, but it's got a gentle hook on the end of it. Hmm. And you're gently guiding the sheep or inspiring the sheep, as I'm sure where you're going. Because, and they want to follow you. That's the difference. Yeah, and, and the leading by inspiration. Say more. Is where people are intrinsically, internally inspired to follow what it is that your direction, your company, your organization represents. And it's, a, and it's an extension of their uh, emotions, their will, their values. Their inner world. Yeah, exactly. And so my that was part of my doctoral dissertation outcome variables was something I called organizational identity, how much you actually are part of the organization within yourself. Yes. And it's very difficult to create. Mm. The only way to do it mm, is to get to know your employees. <laughs> so, and that is, you know, leadership, the way I teach it, it's simple, it is a leader learns to stand in someone else's shoes yeah, and then lead them literally yeah. from their point of reference. And I, that is the magic. I mean, once you can really get, you know, what inspires you, because what inspires me may not inspire them. And that's the magic there, which is not for me, was not figuring out what inspires them but hiring to it. There you go. People who are truly interested in what you're doing. So with our farm that we have, you know, we're growing trees that draw down 11 times the carbon of any tree and they grow in a long, in a short period of time. Like there's a whole spirit there and inspiration. If you buy in, you're in. And if you don't, you think it's a bunch of hooey, that's fine too. But I only want people who believe in the, in the dream. And, and so, yeah, for sure, that manipulation part, that wolf, and I never thought of it as a wolf, but keeping myself at bay when I want to attack because I know it's not good for the herd. It's not good for the organization. I need to just kind of, one of the reasons why I'm founder and chairman of my companies is because I know I'm just going to fuck it up, right? <laughs> and I'm just being completely transparent here. I'm going to cause messes. And then I unfortunately have to ask other people, could you do me a favor and clean this up? But the reality of things is I've got people who are awesome leaders and they can carry the baton. And I'm so comfortable doing that. I'm so much better. And now I can do things like this. Like to be able to talk to awesome mind blowing leaders like you who kind of figure this stuff out. That's next level. And I, and most recently I came up with a term. So I don't know how much you know about Dan Sullivan, a strategic coach. I know we've talked oh, about, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he says there's three types of times. There's buffer time, buffer focus and free time. Right. And it's, the entrepreneurial time system. But like at our farm, at Cali Farms, I consider that my life's work. And it's not work. It's not like I'm doing anything. I could do that all the time if I wanted to. I don't need free time away from the farm in order to enjoy myself. The fact that I'm doing it is rejuvenating. And yeah, I think that for me is... I'm starting to learn about this evolution, if you're aware of entrepreneurship, where you can actually evolve to a place where you feel extremely satisfied. Oh, yeah. With the work that you're doing. It is, it's <clears throat> the way I teach it, it's discernment between monkey, elephant, and soul. Because yes. I have a soul that must create. Yes. And whether that's, you know, tweaking with my bass pond or coming up with neurobiological ways to teach, whatever, it, it's creating. Yes. But my body is, you know, this thing here can experience incredible amounts of contentment when I'm in that right circumstance. I'm tweaking with my vast pond and I'm in this flow state. It's just amazing. But if I sit still, 
my dopamine receptor sites are going, I said, you know, because entrepreneurs hate wasting time. <laughs> so oh but we're phenomenal at doing it. It's incredible how they're, but that sense of wasting time is that boredom gene kicking in. Yeah. If I can't understand that that's a lie, I don't have to do anything, you know, like meet that sensation, it will trigger this cascade in my default modal network then throw it into hyper gear. And all of a sudden I'm, you know, painting the walls and just busy work, wasting time. But the discernment then between my soul's need to create the capacity to call bullshit on my sensations in my body and experience contentment in the present moment. Like my, I am completely content with my life as it is right now. Mm. And I'll never be satisfied. Yeah. With the possibility of the future. Yes. But that urgency, when they all get together, need to create urgently, and I'm, you know, crazy about what I have to do now, you know, I blow things up. I just create chaos. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm big on that. What about risk? Why, <laughs> why risk. do I like risk so much? It's, there's multiple kinds of risks, and I've really explored that since writing Drew, and there, there's sensation seeking risk or risk takers, which are the mountain climbers and the old body surfers that broke my leg and don't do that anymore. Because <laughs> uh, it, it's that amazing sensation that creates that flow state for me. That's a different kind of risk than people that are calculated risk. And I also have that. I'm not too big on the D2 risk, but the, the horizoning risk takers, that's what I'll call them. Shiny on the horizon. Oh, it's going to be so great. It's so amazing. Oh, so amazing. And I, I no matter, nothing's going to stop me from making that happen. Yeah. And that, that kind of calculated risk, you know, where it, it's, I don't feel like I'm really taking big risks because I thought about it. <laughs> but, but the people on the outside of us, you know, or, you know, the board that's overlooking our shoulder going, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Well, we can't afford not to do it. Yeah. And they're like, well, if we don't do it, it's not going to cost us any money. What do you mean we can't afford? Well, yeah, but this potential loss that we're going to in we're not going to lose it yeah yeah but but if we don't do it in the future that's going to make now suck and that is this real dynamic dance between you know the that's dopamine receptor number four dash seven r allele gene it's the fomo gene it is this gene that you know there's more woolly mammoths over the next hill mm. and we're constantly looking for the better yeah. And when that combines with, you know, this logical step that, ooh, that's going to be great. Therefore, this kind of sucks now. Mm. And that confusion between, you know, referencing right now in some future great state, that's complete bullshit. It's a lie. Yeah. How great it's going to be has no relevance on how it is now. And so that, how is it now? Hmm. And that's what I teach everybody. We got to get an accurate assessment of really what is your life now? And will that really make it better? Yeah. What does better even mean? Yeah. And for every driven I've ever worked with, it's freedom. <clears throat> we want to be free to do what we want with no one telling us what to do. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, it's faded away some. When I finally get $10 million in the bank and I get $400,000 a year interest, no one can tell me I could, you know, do money. Yeah. And it, it is the biggest lie I've ever witnessed people it, because totally. our soul can't stop creating. Our soul not going to let us stop. That's right. When am I ever, ever going to be satisfied? When it's, yeah. over, when it's over, maybe. Maybe. So, so in my book, it's called E Squared, the Power of Entrepreneurs, Investing in Entrepreneurs. I... I believe that what investors, especially EIs, which are entrepreneur investors, are looking to latch their cart onto, put their reins onto, is that energy, that drive yep. the entrepreneur has, right? They recognize- It is a classic, you're betting on the jockey, not the horse. Thank you. Yes, betting on the jockey, not the horse. And 
And the reality is there's really something there because this person, as long as they're properly pointed, they're being honest, not being con artists, right? They're being honest about and their intention. It, 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 Humility is the number one thing before I throw money at anybody. And I, I, I do throw money at some of the people I work with because it is, you know, in lieu of pay because it's like, dude, give me some points on this shit because, but then I get to oversee and watch. Yeah. And, you know, because entrepreneurs do a couple things well is, is we, we create and manifest rapidly. Yes, very quick. And we sabotage just as fast. Yeah. So I, I, I ask this question, especially when people are saying, I'm so, I, I can't join EO, the entrepreneurs organization, because I'm so busy putting out fires. And I said, really, it's interesting. I said, if you're putting out fires, I got a question for you. And I asked this of many. I said, if you're putting out fires, are you a paid firefighter? Is this what you get paid to do? Or are you a volunteer firefighter? Are you like looking for fires to put out? Or more importantly, are you an arsonist? Are you lighting them? <laughs> Are you lighting those fires to feel like a hero? And maybe you could just leave your business alone and let the people who run it run it and stop messing with everything because we do that. Yeah, and there's volumes of books written about, about founder itis and you know the classic EO visionary, you know, your goal as a visionary is to not be needed. Hmm. But what is the greatest fear of all human beings, especially driven that already feel like they're not, you know, feel like an imposter and they're not needed, really, no one really. And so we, we prove that we are needed by going in there and I got the next great idea. <laughs> so, so many years, I did it for so many years. And there's a book by both Salim Ishmael called Exponential Organizations. Peter Diamandis introduced me to that. Oh, that's cool. And what's really cool about what Salim says is, is that good organizations at the core of them have an immunity to the entrepreneur who comes in with the shiny new object or idea or so. And what we need to do is to create these R&D experimental units outside yeah. the corpus of what's making them the friggin' money and stop messing everything up. The, the, model, the model that I use is, you know, entrepreneurs were hunters and often make the mistake of creating a hunting organization. Yeah. Hunting for the next big deal. And then we, you know, it's kind of different than what we did before, but we'll figure it out and kind of morph and this constantly evolving. It's a show is what it is. And so the transition usually, you know, somewhere once you hit five or 8 million bucks, you got to build a farm. Yeah. And you cannot scale a hunting organization. You can't. You can only scale a farm. And then once you figure out how to, you know, farm is processes and systems and routines and doing the same thing oh, again, it poison to an entrepreneur, then you give them a small plot of land <laughs> to go with. Yes. But they can't tear down the farm. Yep. Yeah, you know, they get this opportunity, though, to and then if it works on the small plot of land, then we can maybe filter it into another division and filter it in through before we do an organizational wide change. And I will. Because of the rapidly changing environment, I'm seeing the entrepreneurs that I've worked with and been doing it for you know, 15 years. We're needed more and more and more and more and more because the world's changing so fast. Yep. Yeah. So if you're not doing that, if you're not, you know, having a small plot of land or a small division that you get to work with and adapt to the new world as it's changing, you are setting yourself up for the farm just to be antiquated, you know, become buggy whips real damn quick. And so the, the need for the entrepreneur and founders to stay in is what I am seeing more and more and more. You know, they fired Steve Jobs and then brought him back. <laughs> exactly, because that's where the innovation happened. So I've, I've, I've identified and learned about these sprints, and they typically last a quarter for me, right? And I learned about agile training, if you've ever heard of that, or scrum. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. And it's amazing that there is actually training on this because now I'm training my people on different projects and president of our company is like, could you do me a favor? 
and just clean up operations. The culture's wrong. This is, you know, people, he identified a couple problems. And inside of, I don't know, 10 weeks, we've completely turned it around. I've got now 10 times the capacity and I did this and that. Yep. And that's how I operate really well in my organizations. It's, I can, I, I was talking, I was down at the farm. I was talking to the Amigos, the guys who are here legally on an H2A visa, if anybody's listening, but I was getting involved with them about some pettiness that was going on between them. And A, there was a language barrier and B, my body language doesn't read so well to somebody that doesn't understand what the heck I'm saying, even though I'm using translator and so on. And I turned to my farm manager on Monday because this was a weekend. I'm like, I've got many people in my organization to buffer me. I don't have that buffer here and I'm going to mess everything. I think I messed everything up this weekend. I think it was like, well, what? It's, it is, we don't mean to scare the sheep. We don't mean to. Yeah. but we naturally do yeah and so it you know the the difficulty in that is it, that it hurts us yes you know as entrepreneurs at hsps we are highly sensitive people so easily misunderstood for how big of a heart we have really have heck yeah and That's so right. you know we don't want to hurt others we really don't and so it's a yeah but how do you build buffers how do you select them People, people who have my best interests and understand and respect me for what I am and what I represent. And I have the same feelings about them and I coach them along the way. So they're taking a little bit of a rocky road sometimes. They're going to have to deal with my tantrums or whatever they might be going through. <laughs> but then they, you know, Heidi... But they trust, they see your heart. I mean, it takes time to evolve. They know who I am. They know I'm yeah, doing it. They, they, they know you're a good guy. And yeah, I'm not doing it to mess with you. I'm doing it because I'm going to drag this organization. I used to say, listen, I'm imagine I'm a bull pulling a plow, right? And I said, and if you're dragging, putting too much pressure, holding me back, those horns are coming for you. I am going <laughs> And, and and they were like, oh, we get it. We've seen this part of you. Got it. All right. We understand. But you have trusted lieutenants telling you you're moving too fast. Yeah. You pissed off this person or you did this or you did that. Or again, Heidi, bless her soul, will say, OK, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to translate what Steve's trying to say right now. Oh, OK. Now we get it. I'm like. There's a group at DC that I work with that he's got this, and he he's literally Michael Scott. I mean, just foot in his mouth. It's like, oh, don't say that because it is. It feels like a characterological attack when he says hello. <laughs> it is like, I'm not kidding you. We've tried everything, but he literally has a right hand. He has a translator. That's it, and and that's what we need. That's what we need. So let's go back because I know you got to wrap up shortly. And we're talking about this energy focus and the entrepreneurial drive, talking about criminals probably having the same DNA as entrepreneurs. Is that correct? Yes, pretty much. Yeah, we're also, you know, the drug addicts, we're also the, the sociopaths, we're also the Fauci's. I mean, we are we what separates us in the criminal natures that we can have is that we see through social norms and we see through social structures yeah. as they're not real they're just constructs yeah where the sheep actually find safety and security in not questioning them or even knowing that they're not real like you say you know a law is not a real thing right they go well, yes it is mm -hmm. and they don't they don't take that next step of, you know, that fluidity. So, you know, moral relativity is what we can, we can muster. You know, I can rationalize pretty much anything. And, you know, the greater, oh, I'm really not hurting anybody. Mm. It, it, it is that moral oversight, you know, the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And so we, we, you know, have that propensity because we, we aren't wired to work in assembly lines. We're just not that way. 
Understood. Where assembly lines, most people love it. Really? Yeah. yeah well, depending on the rigidity of it. Mm. But they find comfort in the predictability. They're not risk takers. Yeah. They find security in that. And you don't want risk, a bunch of risk takers working for you. You don't want that. Nope. Nope, I've done that, been there, done that, and that was just not good. It was what we call a show. Yeah, because you get to uh, do that in six drivens together trying to create a company. It's like, well, who's going to do the work? <laughs> and so, you know, everybody's got great ideas, and but you need that, you need the bridges to actually get things done. And that's the sheep, that's the, the normals. And I believe our, I believe that we evolve as once we get some cash, let's say. And we turn into that, what I call EI. And my formula is E times EI equals E squared. Uh. So entrepreneur with the entrepreneur investor, somebody who's seasoned, has some money, has connections, has wisdom, and is willing to sit on an advisory board, make introductions to networks and so yeah. on, is so valuable to an organization but as the EI, we're looking, we're monitoring for somebody who's true intention. What's at the heart of this entrepreneur? Are they just, are they truly an entrepreneur driven or are they just making it up so they can have OPM, other people's money? Yeah, and that, that I, I come across more often than not. Now that money is different in 23 than it was in 20, 22, 21, money, it, it's me, there's no free money anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And you you can't bullshit a bullshitter. Yeah. And so that you know what I look for before I throw money at anybody is I get to know them. Mm. You know, I don't buy the story. Yeah. I don't buy the narcissistic fantasy that we can paint. Yeah. Always keeping in mind that D4. Oh my God, it's gonna be so great. Mm. Yeah, but what is it now? <laughs> well, it's an idea and I gotta I gotta you know, piece of paper and some drawings on it. It's like, so you basically have nothing now. Yeah. But don't you see the real potential? And it's like, yeah, but what do you have now? Yeah. And so the, the you know, the delta between the fantasy and the reality is the, the number one thing I call bullshit on. And it's like, well, I've got, you know, four people sitting on my board and I got half the program written and we're in beta testing here and this is it. And, you know, and then I asked simply, when does it become real? Yeah. Well, we're probably 18 months away from, you know, MVP and did it, okay. You know where you're at. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not sucked into that narcissistic fantasy about how great it's going to be. But as you said, yeah. without that inspiration, without that, but I know this is going to work deeper. That's the jockey that I'm looking for. Yeah. Is that they, they, in their gut of guts, they know, they, they know it's going to work and you know, that dog ain't going to give up that bone no matter what. And, yeah. and then they're willing, the humility, they're willing to ask for help. You know, Jean Greaves, Dr. Greaves was one of my last professors and she, right before I got my PhD and she, she said, expertise is true. Expertise is understanding how much you don't know about one particular subject. Mm. Mm. It's like, I don't know, a, I know some about neurobiology, more than most, but there's so much I don't know. Like, oh, and it inspires me. Yeah. That's an expert and it's a yeah. mastery in that. And she said, the most important thing about that is not that you become an expert, it's because you learn to spot it in others. And I said, that, that is getting repeated. Brilliant. You know, again, I was talking to Joe Polish and he says, you know, you know the story about the rock soup? And I had known it, you know. He goes, I feel like most entrepreneurs are that story around rock soup where, you know, a guy, two guys come to a village and they tell people that they can make soup out of a rock. And then somebody's bringing the carrots and somebody's bringing the meat and so on. He goes, I feel like that's most entrepreneurs that I'm talking to. They got these projections that are BS. And you know, it's just pulled out of thin air. He goes, you know, it's, it, it's, but, but can they get, can they rally the troops? Can they get people thinking their way? Can they get enough people to actually make the soup and, and, and it actually tastes good? And people then maybe are even willing to buy the soup. Wow, look at that. 
I'd never thought about the rock soup being an entrepreneurial story, but it certainly is. Yeah, and it, it's, you have to have enough of that fantasy. And, and this is why I get everybody meditating because it, it's reality checking. Mm. Mm. And where, where, where are we at? Yeah. You know, what's our burn rate? What's our income? What's our, you know, what, what is the reality of this, you know, thing that we're about to launch here? And I've worked with so many guys that 28 year old has no clue what a fucking nightmare it is to start a company. They have none. Thank God, or they wouldn't do it. Yes, <laughs> it's you know, but they get into it, and then you get so far into it, you can't stop. Yeah, and you know the perseverance and the that that jockey of not giving up. They gain humility, and they you know hopefully struggle on their first one. Don't have a home run on their first one. That's yeah. a kiss of death. Somebody, so s people who have done it have a list of successful ventures is always a good bet uh, yep. in my opinion because they're often not doing it for the money they're doing it because they just can't stop their drive um and and, and that's a big part of it listen i know that the drive is something that's going to be palpable and you're going to come up with a drive meter one of these days so I can just kind of go, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> and there it is. Like, oh, this guy's a 10. This guy's a three. This gal. It, it is this, this thing that this would be an important part of it to, to, there are people that are inspiring and that are soul inspired. They're manifestors. They really are. They see something in the world that must be created. Yes. And then you have others that have to create because they're running from fear to prove themselves to to it's a narcissistic kind of investment in you know my phd's were done because i was hoping that it would get rid of this inner shame mm. and i was driven mm. but it was a different kind of it was an inspiring kind of soul purpose yeah at first brilliant brilliant at first it's yeah. the only thing, the only reason that can make me cry. The only reason I didn't stop was because I couldn't because of my soul. Yeah. That is that you see someone who's learned that, bet on them. That's it. They, you feel it. You feel they're like, no, this guy is like, this ain't, this ain't about some, he needs to prove himself. Yeah. And it, it's, it is a deeper kind of a, it's, I don't know how else to say it other than your intuition will tell you. Yeah. And then a few couple of questions to make sure they're not full of shit and, you know, what's reality and, and that. And you'll see them, you know, and I get this, all of my real entrepreneurs, I call them, the, you know, the, the guy who's doing the sports leagues or whatever, you know, the, why are you doing this? Well, oh, I just want to help the world. And it, it's like bullshit. The reason he's doing it is because when he was 11 and his parents got divorced, he walked onto a sports field. And it, it's his heart. Yeah. And that is what I, you know, Yanker, you know, when types, you know, and we went through COVID. <laughs> he, just old, he went from five million a month to zero in literally three weeks. Damn. Yeah. And they survived. Yeah. And they survived because he wasn't going to, it, it shook his soul in that um, real deep way. That is what you want to be betting on right there. Yeah. That's the investment right there. Being able to identify, palpate that, the soul of an entrepreneur of why they're actually doing it. Is it to run from shame and fear and am I good enough and blah, 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 all of those good things. And I don't mean to minimize it by saying blah, 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 but the list of things that cause that, is it ego or is it, it soul? It, 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 and it's usually all of those things and you got to fish a little bit to find the soul. Yeah, yeah. And if you fish really quickly with somebody, you can miss it. Yes. And you spend a little time with them and you actually you know, see him struggle and you, you'll see this and feel this deeper need that they have to, to heal their own trauma. It's really what it comes down to. It's beautiful. I mean, it's amazing. I've kept you a real long time and I appreciate the heck out of you spending some time with me and I'm very excited 
to include you in my next book. Appreciate that. I I am building the world's largest community of private investors, entrepreneurial investors, to be able to help meaningful, impactful entrepreneurs scale and grow. And you will be part of that, my friend. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm, I'd be honored to. That's in my heart. Yeah, because I, you know, driven to we 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 are the ones who actually will destroy the world and save the world. <laughs> so we've got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's in pretty good balance, but we we want to tip those scales because you know, because big pharma is run by a bunch of drivens. All these big insurance is run by a bunch of drivens, but they're just they're not driven by heart. They're driven by greed. Yeah, and that's not I think, okay. I think the principalities and the yeah, what we need to do is actually it's a it's a spiritual battle between you know heart and fear. Absolutely. Well. Dr. Doug Brockman, thank you so much. Okay. Author of Driven. And what's the new book that's coming out? When is that it coming is out? April 24th of 24 is Sheep, Wolves, and Shepherds. Yee. Yeah, and I don't have the tagline yet, but we're working on it. It's it's well in the it's well organized. Yeah, it's it's I'm writing every day. It's pouring out of me. Hey Amen. Can't wait to read it. And I will see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for listening to the Entrepreneur Land podcast powered by Pitchology. For more information, additional episodes, and content, visit pitchology.ai, where you can also pick up a copy of my newest book, Once Upon a Time in Entrepreneur Land.